Our uh, guest speaker this afternoon is South African, am I not correct? He's a graduate of mining engineering from the University of New South Wales, Australia. He graduated with an honors in law and honors in accounting from the University of Stellenbosch, South Africa. Great wine there. Oh, I'd love to study there. He holds a master's in law and a higher tax diploma from the University of Johannesburg. He completed the advanced MBA program at Harvard Business School. And prior to being located in the Philippines, he headed the growth team of Goldfields as general manager for corporate development with a key focus on identifying and negotiating growth opportunities in Australia and Asia. He also worked with the Goldfields global legal team negotiating and implementing various merger and acquisition transactions in countries including Ghana, Peru, Venezuela, Canada, the US, and South Africa. A few words about Goldfields. Goldfields is one of the world's largest unhedged producers of gold. Goldfields has an attributable annualized production of 3.6 million gold equivalent ounces from eight operating mines in Australia, Ghana, Peru, and South Africa. Goldfields has an extensive and diverse global growth pipeline with four major projects in resource development and feasibility with construction decisions expected in the next 18 to 24 months. It is reported that Far South East Gold Copper Project in the Philippines represents one of Goldfield's best Greenfield's growth opportunities. Did the stock just go up another 50 centavos uh, of Lepanto? In September 2010, Goldfields signed an option agreement to acquire a 60% interest in the Far South East project. Following the signing of the option agreement, Goldfields undertook due diligence, including drilling programs to confirm previous feasibility studies on the Far Southeast deposit. Ladies and gentlemen, to speak on the topic, sustainable development localizing best practices, please put your hands together and join me, give a very warm welcome to the president and CEO of Goldfields, Philippines Corporation, Brett Madison. Good afternoon, and thanks very much for the invitation. Uh, Kevin's been hounding me probably for a year now. <laughs> We've been around for a long time, yeah, in the, in the Philippines, but I guess we were just waiting until we had vested interest and we had something tangible to say. So thanks very much for, for listening today. The standard waiver, which... <laughs> All New York listed companies have to, uh, I'm not going to take you through it. So who is Goldfields? And I promise I'm not going to make this a corporate presentation, so don't worry. I know you can all read the internet. But uh, just to take you through some of the diversification in Goldfields, starting, um, I guess, on the west. Um, we have two, sorry, one operation, uh, Sierra Corona in, in Peru. We signed that deal in 2003 and brought it into production in 2008. Um, we also have the interesting Chukapaka project, which is a joint venture, which I'll talk about in the next slide. Moving along, we've got Tarquin Demang in, in Ghana. Um, we'll, I'll talk a bit more about Demang, but Tarqua is a million ounce producer, or was in its heyday. Um, and then we move into, I guess, what's, what's the cornerstone of, of Goldfield's existence. Goldfields actually turns 125 years this year. Um, and interestingly enough, that's the same age as Johannesburg, uh, which is where gold was obviously first discovered in South Africa. And it's quite fitting that the two share their 125th anniversary in the same year. Historically, South Africa has represented the base load of our production. Um, but in time, we've obviously followed an area of uh, internationalization, 
and try to diversify our portfolio. Um, we now have three mines in South Africa, as you can see, producing in the region of um, 1.7 million ounces, which is less than 50% of our portfolio, and that will continue to decrease as we diversify further around the world. Agnew and St. Ives, um, both in Australia, together they produce in the region of about 650,000 ounces, with St. Ives producing about 400,000 ounces. So all in all, I mean, in terms of production, 3.7 million ounces from eight mines. The interesting thing for me is obviously the size of the resource and the reserve. Uh, in terms of reserves, we number three in the, in the world. Um, but in terms of resource, we, we head up closer to number two, which is, is good and it shows a long-term sustainable um, portfolio for gold fields. Into growth now. Goldfields about three years ago decided, or four years ago, decided that we'd really focus on growth opportunities through exploration and development. And we really went onto an active campaign of promoting um, exploration and development projects. And we've really seen the fruits come through. Um, we've got an interesting joint venture uh, property in Chukapaka. It's about an 8 million ounce uh, resource at the moment with our partners Bonaventura. They are well-known uh, Peruvian family. We hope to make a decision on that later this year uh, in terms of bringing that into production and that will be a nice addition to our Sierra Corona operation. We then move across to, to Mali where we have the Yanfalila um, operation. Well, it's not really an operation. It's a series of open pitable or potential open pitable resources. Uh, we'll probably have some sort of toll treatment agreement um, that will get us up to about 200,000 ounces a year. We then move up into the cold of Finland. We've had APP, which is the Arctic Platinum Partnership, for a period of about 11 years now. It's been through its ups and downs. It's had metal price difficulties. It's had processing difficulties. But it seems as though we've, we've found ways to unlock that, both through the use of Platsol, which is a a newly, um, well it's not really new, but it's, we're running pilot plants at the moment, uh, a way to, to extract more of the palladium and, and platinum without um, being degraded by, by the other deleterious metals in, in the ore. And then also the metal prices. It's a palladium rich uh, deposit, so with palladium prices going up it's become a lot more viable. So that'll be an interesting addition. And then moving down, as I mentioned, um, into Ghana, Demang, Super Pit. We bought Demang in 2002. Um, in fact, the year I started at Goldfield, the first deal we did. Um, and that, when, when we bought it, it, it had 1.2 million ounces in reserve. The Super Pit alone now has 4 million ounces. So it's an extension of the existing mineralization and a good addition to the Goldfields fold. And then I guess last but not least is why we're here today <laughs> to talk about Far South East. And um, I'm not going to talk about it now, but we'll, we'll talk about it as we go. So that's really Goldfields in a nutshell. Um, I guess we could go on for, for longer, but that would bore you all. Um, we're here to talk about Far South East. So what is Far South East? Far South East is a world-class copper gold porphyry system. Um, that exists, and, and we'll, we'll talk to the location and, and provide you a few pictures shortly. But as you can see, it's a typical gold copper porphyry system, and excuse me, excuse me, I'm not a geologist, so to all the geologists, excuse my lack of proper phrasing, but um, as you can see, you obviously have the feeder system here, which is your, your underlying porphyry. You have the Victoria veins, which would be your first intrusion, and it's the gold-rich veins that the Panta are currently mining. The secondary intrusion is the energite deposit that was mined historically by the Panto, predominantly copper, high in arsenic. Uh, it's typical of, a, of that kind of system. And then underneath you have the feeder system um, that feeds it all, and that is what we're talking about here. That's far southeast. We spoke earlier about the discovery of far southeast in 1980, uh, Mr. Decini was obviously there, and the Panto were heavily involved um, in that discovery. And since then, there have been uh, a number of, of companies uh, involved. 
a number of activities around it. Historically, there have been about 80 diamond drill holes stuck right into the far southeast deposit. Um, I'll, I'll run through that in a bit more detail. But what we know, and I'll run through it in a bit more detail now, is it's big. We call it a bad deposit because it's better at depth. And it's only getting bigger. So we'll talk about it in a bit more detail. In terms of where it is, I mean, it's always important where a project is in terms of infrastructure, location, um, and access. Far south. Far south east is located pretty nicely in terms of infrastructure. Um, it has ready access to Baguio, which is 93 kilometers away by road. There's also a, a road um, up via Cervantes and through Tegudin down into various potential port facilities, which make the shipping of concentrate a lot easier. 3,500 kilometers from Japan, 3,000 kilometers from Korea, 3,000 kilometers from China, all pretty good for marketing. Um, in terms of other infrastructure, there are several power, uh, power supplies um, here. Obviously, some of them support the existing operations of Lepanto, and they'll be fairly easy to, to, to lock in to, to far southeast. So in terms of infrastructure and location, pretty good. I just included a few slides just to show, give you a picture of, of uh, what it actually looks like up there and the work Lepanto have done historically. It's a pretty impressive mine. Uh, I always tell my wife it's the, it's the most pretty mine <laughs> you'll find, uh, somewhere you, where you'd take your wife to go and have a look. And uh, I'm sure people who've been up there will attest to that. Um, so that's the airstrip. Um, 850 meters of daunting fun as, <laughs> as you land in there. But that's it. You then have the tailings dam, which is uh, built by, by Lepanto in far southeast. Uh, Pretty, pretty good standards, pretty good world, world standards and, and audited internationally. Then, just talking now in a, in a bit of detail and for the geologists uh, among, among the crowd, I just really wanted to reiterate what we saw. Um, so what, what attracted us to, to Far South East, really? Um, for, for the layman in the crowd, and that probably includes me, and I've had to be told, Pink is good. Pink is pretty. Pink is good for, for gold resources. Okay? So the pink here you see is very high grade mineralization. And that's, that's what we saw at the time. The interesting thing to note here though is you can see the blue, excuse the quality of the picture and I'm kind of craning my neck to, to see it, but the blue, the blue drill um, holes uh, are depicted here. The interesting thing to note about them is you'll see they're all vertical or sub-vertical. That means straight down into the heart of the ore body. Now, that's great, and it showed us that there was vertical continuity. So we knew that there was a monster down there and that there was good continuity vertically. But if you look at the drill hole spacing, and, and what we've done basically is take a bird's eye view. So if you're flying over the, the deposit, this is what you'd see with a black representing the historic drill holes you'll see that the spacing between the drill holes is fairly large. Uh, each of these blocks is 40 by 40 meters. So you're looking in some places where the spacing between them is up to 300 meters. Okay? This is a monster ore body. Uh, it has dimensions of probably a kilometer by a kilometer of solid mineralization. But still, you need to know what you're dealing with in terms of spatial continuity. And that's what Goldfields in coming in wanted to decide. They wanted to ensure that what they were seeing here, or what we were seeing here vertically, repeated itself on a spatial orientation as well, so that we could get, a, get an idea of the magnitude of what we were dealing with. So mindful of this, that's the deal. We entered into a joint venture, well, an option agreement with uh, Lepanto and an offshore investor in September 2010. And it was subject to, obviously, 18 months of due diligence, which had in, had in mind. And I apologize for not facing you. It's just a bit difficult to point backwards. So <laughs> please excuse me. So it included underground drilling, surface drilling to, to verify the geotechnical considerations. And then, obviously, on the community side, we wanted to get a good feel. The Panto had been operating the region for what was 73 and a half years at that, at that stage. We wanted to ensure. Um, that it, 
we could be comfortable entering into, into the Philippines. So we entered into an 18-month option agreement to acquire 60% interest, and that was also subject to an FTAA, which I'll talk about shortly. Now let's talk about some of the work we've done. <clears throat> basically, the outline of the ore body is here, and that's a section view. So basically, if you cut, cut the ore body looking straight ahead of you, that, that's what you'd see. You see the high-grade mineralization in the middle, the pretty colors in the middle. Um, what we wanted to do really, as, as I've mentioned before, is we wanted to test the horizontal or, spati or spatial um, continuity of the ore body. We had seen <laughs> the, the good results coming down, but we wanted to drill across the ore body and make sure that it all kind of lined up. And what we found was better than expected. Um, not only was the continuity there, uh, the vertical lined up with the inverted holes, but I mean, we're looking at Bonanza type deposits. You've got nearly a kilometer, two grams gold equivalent. This is really <laughs> something special that we all have here. And um, it's just, yeah, it's really good to look at. Uh, our geologists, every time we put this up, get too excitable. <laughs> but I mean, this is really special. The other, the, the other thing we've noticed through the drilling, obviously, is, is we're getting the correlation in the middle. So the high grade is where the high grade's meant to be. But what we're seeing, interestingly, is the geologists, as you know, can't say stop. If they're still in mineralization, they're going to carry on drilling. And that's exactly what happened here with hole 1303. They went 400 meters past where they were meant to go. That's nearly half a kilometer. And we're still in mineralization. So this thing is big. It's open in every direction. And um, I think just the heat's going to stop us at the end of the day, uh, just as we get down there. It's, it's very big. This is a bit of a messy slide, so just, just excuse. Uh, I just want to really just take, take you through this, and I'll try and explain it as simplistically as I can, or at least the way it's understandable for me. The blue lines are obviously the historical Lepanto information. The red lines are our drill, drill holes. What we're seeing here really is... This, the patch here is the tons, okay? So in any gold deposit, I mean, it's all about the grade and how many tons, tons there are of it. At a, at a cutoff of 0.8, which is 0.5 copper equivalent, you're dealing with something in the region of a billion tons of ore uh, for 52 million ounces of gold equivalent. That's our target at the moment. If that converts into a mineral resource, it will put it into one of the top five mineral resources in the world. So this is genuinely world class, and this is all we're looking at. As I mentioned, it's open in all directions. The interesting thing for me, though, is here. Now, this is your ounces per vertical meter, and really looks at the quality of the ore body. If you look at the guts of the ore body, which is here, you're getting 75,000 ounces per vertical meter which is really outstanding. But then, as you increase the cutoff grade, so in other words, as you become more selective in your mining practices, we're seeing a, not, not a big drop in tonnage um, and not a big drop in the grade. So it's, it's pointing to the quality of the ore body as well. And even when you go smaller to a cutoff grade of, of three grams per tonne, which is highly selective mining, you're still getting very big chunks of mineralization at fantastic grades. So what it's saying is, is basically there are a variety of ways you can, you can bring this, this, uh, this potential mine to bear, and it supports both bulk and selective mining methods in terms of the quality of, of the ore body. So just an overall summary of, of where we're at, and this has been released uh, into the public domain. We're looking at a target, exploration target of 52 million ounces. Um, as I've mentioned before, we're looking at something that's about a kilometer underground. Now, for the, in the Philippines, that's pretty deep. Uh, South African standards at four and a half kilometers underground, that's not too bad. So, yeah, I think we, we're pretty well placed to be able to extract that. In terms of the mining, mining, we're looking at anything from 4 million tons per annum. 25 is probably conservative. It, it'll probably go, go up if, if we look at bulk mining methods. 
Regardless of the method, there will be twin declines and twin shaft developments, big money into the ground, a lot of lead time. Um, in terms of processing, the beauty of this ore body is it's, it's pretty clean, no deleterious materials, fairly easy to process. Um, conventional flotation circuit, which we run in Sarah Corona, so it's no rocket science here. And the initial results we're receiving not only confirm the Lepanto historical data, but actually improve on it. So we've seen copper recoveries in the region of 92 to 93%, and gold up at 88, which is really good for a porphyry system. And then in terms of infrastructure, we've, we've spoken about. So mindful of all of that in March this, uh, this year, uh, Goldfields elected to exercise 40% of its option. So Goldfields now hold 40% of Far Southeast Gold Resources, which holds the FSC deposit. And we have an option to acquire the remaining 20% when the FTAA is, is issued, which we expect later this year. Okay, now to the interesting <laughs> part. Um, I'd like to just talk generally about global opportunities and challenges. Um, I'm mindful of, of what's happened over the last four months. Um, perhaps we were meant to talk today because we agreed on this in November and uh, the proverbial hit the fan in January, so <laughs> here we are. Um, but basically, I'd, I'd like to to, to look at some stats of, of where we're going. I mean, we've all heard um, Mr. Pangalinen talking about it, but if you look at some of the stats, it's pretty overwhelming uh, what this world is doing and, and where the world will be. Um, you've got three million middle-class consumers. That means a lot more spending on consumer goods, more minerals, 50,000 more skys skyscrapers, 221 more cities the size of Chicago built um, in the next 12 years. Uh, along with that comes, obviously, steel and steel production. I think the interesting thing, though, is, is this, is investment. It's becoming more and more expensive to build. And what McKinsey are saying is that to meet the world's demands, we're going to need a trillion dollars of investment.